Check. There we go. Welcome, thank you for coming. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about what it means to use voice inside of applications and how you can use that yourself. And uh, Jeff already kind of said a little bit about me. I just introduced myself real fast. With Alyssa's comments, I think I should just point out, like, this is the place that I would go for that calm, peace, serenity out in the mountains, in particular, the Smoky Mountains. That's, that's a place that's near and dear to me. And hiking out there in the natural uh, environment is one of the things that I'm really passionate about. So there's other things about me. Obviously, you can We'll keep on going. Um, a few months back, the Google Home platform uh, came out. And then uh, the Alexa has been around for a little while longer than that. But there was a time where they opened up the APIs to let people start developing their own things. And I thought, huh, I wonder if I can do something with that. And of course, as an Angular guy, I was like, I probably can figure out how to talk to it and then do something in my Angular app. And I know other people have said the same thing and have probably done similar stuff. However, I went ahead and prototyped it and then started submitting talks all over the place. And uh, when one got accepted, I was like, oh no, now I have to actually uh, make this all work correctly. But more importantly, I need to write the presentation. And as I worked through this, it, the journey from, OK, I have a moment of this cool idea to the moment that I realized that I'm actually much more excited about the natural language behind it. What is actually powering this? What makes this really work? And the power that it can provide for our users and their experiences in life, uh, that gets me so much more excited than the fact that I have a really interesting demo. And to illustrate this point, I have a fun little video clip. Now, if you're not a Star Trek person, it's OK. Uh, you don't need to really know anything about it. But this is from the, lost, uh, the Voyage Home. Just of it is, they go in the future. They come back to 1986, for whatever reason. And they need a humpback whale to save the world. It sounds really weird. Just watch the movie. But in this little subplot, and this is what I love about movies, and science fiction is, is, is famous for this, they, they tell small truths in, in this little segment. So just take a moment to see how these voyagers from the future interact with the computer of 1986. Hey? <laughs> You're joking. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? Computer? Ah. Hello, computer. <laughs> Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. How quaint. And then look at this computer. This is great. This is exactly how you all work today, I know. It's, just, it's fantastic. It's a blast from the past. But this brief illustration shows how people of the future will use computers if we enable them to do that, right? And since science fiction always tells us these truths, I have this theory that natural language is going to be the way that we improve the user experience going forward. It is going to be fundamental for applications of tomorrow. In fact, that will be your differentiation in the marketplace if you can use natural language. And I'm going to illustrate this a little bit further with an example. This is the data bank application from the World Bank. And essentially, it allows you to look through a whole bunch of metrics about population and economic data about all the countries of the world. And it's a really interesting tool. And it's not that I want to point this out as a bad website or anything. This is a great tool. And it works, but it's a bit complicated. And I want to walk through it with you. And so we're, we start with a question. So the first question that I want to try and answer is, what are the population trends for a country? Can you give me a country? Albania. Albania, OK. That's going to be really easy to find in this list. But OK, we'll pick Albania. And so I want to go through the tool in order to find out what are population trends for Albania. So here's the application. And I've actually done this a couple of times. So I'm going to walk through it with you. But first things first, I have to come in here and select a country. Lo and behold, Albania is pretty high on the list. I'm going to pick that. The next step is, as it says on the right, I need to pick a series. OK. Come down here. So I said I want population information. So I see that there is a lot of metrics, 1,400 and some. So I'm going to search population, hit Enter. Still have 118 to search through. Here we go. Where's the population? Keep going, keep going. Lots of data. 
There we go, population total, I know that's the one I want. You might not know, and that could take you a little bit more trial and error. And I'll just pick for the last 20 years, and that selects those years. Apply those changes, and then we get information, let me hide this on the side. We get this information about, here are the population trends year by year from the last 20 years. And we can also then click on the chart and receive that information in a visual format. Um, for some reason at this resolution, it doesn't show it quite as easily as it does on the normal desktop, but that line should be changing just a little bit. I actually don't know what the population has been like. It looks like it's actually declined over the years, and you can see a slight decline. So that was the experience, that it took me a few seconds, maybe 45 seconds, to walk through selecting the country, selecting the metric, selecting a time range, and then ultimately viewing the data to get the result I'm looking for. What can we do with voice to make that a little bit easier? And I have this demo that I'll show you, but um, let's just talk about voice for one brief second. Even these types of experiences uh, can be challenging. So what we want to focus, though, is on how to use natural language. And I can just go ahead and ask questions like this to my device. So OK, Google, uh, show me population trends for Albania. The population growth rate of Albania was minus 1.0% OK, so you couldn't hear that, but it said the annual population trends were negative point something percent over the last year. I need to switch this on. Uh, yes. OK, there we go. So I can use voice to voice commands, but that gives me one data point. I want to be able to consume that information visually. So let's take a look at how that demo could work. This is my conceptual application. I'll talk a bit about how it works, but I'm able to speak to it, and it will render out the results on the screen. So instead of me typing or anything, I'm just going to engage it with my Google Home device. OK, Google, control my app. Sure, here is the test version of control my app. What is your request? Show me population trends for Albania. I'm sorry, I don't have that kind of data. I understand data about population and economy. Okay. I wonder if the microphone's causing some issues. Um, OK, Google, show me, information, show me population trends for Albania. Sure thing. There we go. So it's showing that. There's a webhook that calls it through. And of course, the demo is going to fail on me. <laughs> Let me pick this up here. Let me try typing this, because show population trends for Albania. There we go. So I also can input it via text. Either way, it captures that uh, input. And what will happen is when my voice or whether it's text, it ultimately flows through the same process, except for if it's the entry point through the Google Home device. So I'm able to use natural language and state a very simple thing. I want to know this type of information. And my application says, I can figure that out. How do we do that? We'll talk about that in just a second. But what about this experience makes this a better alternative to having the uh, search facets on the side of the screen? And it's that it reduces the friction. It makes it easy for me to visualize what I want and just speak that information. I don't have to spend a lot of time clicking and guessing. I simply can state it in my mind, because for the most part, I can picture what I'm looking for much more quickly than I can click and drag or type or, or use that input device, that whatever input device has been created. You know, no matter how well we design UX, I can typically think through it in my head quicker and more efficiently. So how does this work? So it uses a couple of things. In this case, we're using the actions on Google Platform. Once I speak, that captures it. And then it goes in through this loop. And actually modified it just a moment ago. But with this Actions on Google platform, it's going to take my vocal input. I trigger an intention that says, use my app, and in this case, control my app. And then I state whatever information I want. Show me a table of uh, top most populous countries. Show me a chart of the smallest economies. And it will use that information and say, OK, I know you want to talk to your application, and I'm going to go ahead and route that. So it's, it's a bit like a way of capturing your input turning it into text, and then routing it. So it's mostly a router, but it does do the, the input uh, voice to text
conversion for you. The real power is in this API.ai layer. This is your natural language processing layer, or uh, in this case, it's a service that makes it very easy. So far, I haven't written any code, and I won't write any code to make this work either. You can also implement this as a Node.js kind of thing on your own, but I went down that path and had to write a lot of code versus no code, and I like writing no code. So in this case, this service lets me map information. So I can say, I know that these are the 10 things that someone might say in various ways that will eventually trigger the same result. I want to show me uh, the most populous countries, display a table of most populous countries, show countries with the largest population. This is just three uh, variations of asking the same question. So with this tool, it allows me to highlight and say, these words are parameters. These words I care about, and I also want them to be normalized. And so words like population, populous, you know, it might be economic data, it might be uh, largest economy, these words can all be normalized so that later on my application knows one word, which will be either population or uh, GDP, perhaps. So I can use, show me a, a list of countries by population, show me a chart of countries by population, and I'll get different parameters based on what people say. But there's a really interesting side point here is that I may list 10 versions of this statement, but with machine learning and using the API.ai layer, it will automatically start to incorporate additional statements that are similar enough that it has confidence in that says, okay, you have a slight change, but this is still a matching statement. And it will still map it for you, and it will get smarter and smarter, and you don't have to continuously try to guess what are all the possible permutations that I can speak in order to get this response. And that's really the power of natural language, and that's really the heart of the tool, is being able to dissect what was said without having to programmatically do regex parsing on every, stent, uh, every word of the sentence, for example. I love this quote because it's not just true for English, but it's true also for lots of other languages, but fundamentally, you don't want to spend all of your effort trying to make uh, very complex uh, algorithms and things when they exist. Uh, in order to parse a sentence in many different ways. Use the tools that exist out there because many of us as UI and UX engineers aren't necessarily proficient in this area. And while we may love it and want to learn about it, sometimes we just gotta get things done. Next, this goes into Firebase. And this is actually kind of interesting. Um, about an hour ago, I changed my flow to use Firebase. I used to have a Heroku server because I needed a, a webhook that goes from API.ai to Firebase. Well, Firebase apparently just released cloud functions a few days ago, and if you stay to the next talk, they'll talk exactly about this. And it took me about two minutes to write a cloud function, deploy it, and change my flow. So I kicked out a Heroku server. But basically, API.ai sends those parameters. It says, here's what you said, and here's the metadata associated with it. I put that in Firebase, and then it gets synced instantly with my Angular application. And my Angular application just goes out and says, here's the data that I just received from a new request. Here's the data set I care about. Here's the information, uh, whether it's a metric, I want to see it sorted by top or bottom, and I want it to show 10 or a, a chart or a list. That information all gets distilled. And most of the application is just searching through a data set, formatting that data in some way. And so I wrote, quite frankly, about 200 lines of custom code for all of that stuff to work, not just the Angular piece, but also that webhook piece. So what are the potential use cases for you? You want to start thinking about this for yourself. Where can you start to put this into practice? And yesterday on Twitter, I saw a wonderful example. Somebody had built out an invoicing software platform where instead of you sitting there and typing in all of these things, you can simply say, start an invoice for contractor Joe $100 for services rendered, and send it to them. You say that, it fills in all of that stuff, and submits it to them to their contact file on, on file. And you just sat there and filled it out probably in a third of the time. I think that's a wonderful example. Other places where you have lots of decisions to make in your UX, those are places where you can really get uh, your users into natural language. Things that take too many decisions become more difficult. And if I can conceptually say it in a sentence, but it takes me three or four decisions and clicks and, and whatnot, uh, that's a prime candidate. 
And even if you're uh, more of an ad type agency or you're doing like promo products, what if you can do like interactive tours with voice? What if you can do ways to discover information, whether it's help or documentation? Lots of ways that that can be leveraged. And also finally, the most exciting I think is connecting devices across the home or across the workplace. You might be in the kitchen and you would say, hey, can you show me the recipe that I'm cooking? And then you just say, oh yeah, by the way, preheat the oven. And what happens is it will go look at the recipe, figure out what the right temperature is, because you can process that and you can figure out terms like preheat oven to blank, grab that parameter, and then send it over to your oven that happens to be smart uh, enabled or whatever, uh, and turns on your oven. That's the kind of future, and that's where you're gonna really improve the quality of life, because it's about making it so that people just enjoy their life. They don't sit and engage in a session with their devices anymore. We engage in moments, we engage in life, and that's where natural voice comes in. We've been speaking for millennia, we've been clicking and typing for decades, which is more natural. So, a couple of cautions and things that I noticed along the way that you should be aware of. Security. When I speak, and if you tried to yell out right now, you could probably get it to do something, right? So in a public setting, voice can be a bit of a challenge. Think about that. My daughter likes to play her music on our Alexa because she figured out how to say whatever she needs to say to play her music, much to our own indignation. And then we also have other problems where how do you know that the right person is speaking? How do you know they are authorized? Uh, there's other concerns. This technology that I showed wasn't exactly designed to do the way that I've described it. And so while it's possible, there's some things that probably still need to be developed. You and I are gonna have to get out there and start building some stuff and start to shape the technology to make this all really smooth. And, and kind of in the end, it's about being good stewards. There's lots of things that we can do to make people's lives easier, but we can also be very invasive. We can also cause privacy issues. So keep those things in mind. But the technology is there, and most of this, like I said, a couple hundred lines of code, it's actually very accessible to us today. So go out and you can start to prototype with some things. So, kind of in conclusion, you have the tools in front of you, and when people are speaking at your application, it's really up to you and your creativity to take what they say and make it meaningful for them. And this is my favorite part about the user experience. It's about living, it's about making everything easier for them, and natural language is far more accommodating to them than most of the other types of input that we have. As useful as they are, and as important as they are, they will remain, but natural language is something we need as front-end engineers to, to really be uh, pushing as well. And so I like to end with this because really, at the end of the day, this is where we begin. As the end of what the customer is asking for, or what our user is asking for, is where we get to be creative to make that experience great for them. So, if you have any questions, I'll be around at the Ask Me Anything sessions and things like that. Come find me, grab me here at uh, Gnome on the Run. I have the GitHub project if you wanna see the Angular application, and I'll be writing some on the blog about how this all works. And if you have feedback, I'll incorporate it into a workshop I'm gonna do for three hours at OSCON that will build this exact thing, so, or something like it. Um, so give me feedback, I'll be happy to hear it. So thank you very much.